When we think of Galilee, we will most likely think first about the Sea of Galilee and the villages that line its coasts. So much of the portion of the action of the Gospels that occurs in Galilee occurs around or on this large lake. The region of Galilee itself was much bigger. It stretched at least 15 miles to the north, 15 to the south, and about 25 to the west of the center of the Sea of Galilee. The village of Nazareth is a full day's journey, an 18-mile walk from the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. But apart from the villages of Nazareth and Cana, it is really the Sea of Galilee that dominates the set, as it were, of Jesus' activity in this region. And among all the villages around the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum stands out as the one most often singled out as the specific location of one of Jesus' teachings or actions. In the Gospel of Matthew, we are told that after his baptism and temptation, Jesus made his home in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. It became his own town, as we hear again later in the same gospel. Because of the archaeological work that has been done at Capernaum, it is indeed a highlight not only of the gospels, but also of the region of Galilee today for people interested in the context of Jesus' life and ministry, though in all fairness, Magdala has become a close competitor. Nevertheless, what we can see in Capernaum invites us to think about a number of realities that dominated the time, energy, and lived spaces of the people to whom Jesus went out to proclaim that the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, as we read in Mark 1, 15. These include the institution of the synagogue, the residences of the 99% of the population, and some of the basics of the economy that occupied and sustained, if only just barely, the people of Galilee's villages. Galilee appears to have been left largely depopulated after the Assyrian invasion that brought an end to the northern kingdom of Israel in 721 BC. We see some colonization, especially military colonization, again in the third and second centuries BC, first under the Ptolemaic kingdom based in Egypt, and then under the Seleucid empire based in Syria. The ongoing struggles between those two empires and then between rivals within each empire prevent lasting investment in colonization. Between 167 and 141 BC, a Judean priest named Judas Maccabeus and his brothers led a successful revolution against Seleucid rule, and then used the rivalries within the Seleucid Empire that greatly weakened its kings to make Judea a free and independent state for the first time in 440 years. Under their descendants, the high priestly kings of the Hasmonean dynasty, the Judeans aggressively colonized Galilee, reclaiming it, as part of their ancestral heritage as Israelites, as they also did in regard to Samaria and the regions east of the Jordan River. From the late second century BC on then, we begin to find new settlements throughout Galilee and to find at these settlements the same telltale signs of Jewish occupation that one finds in Judea to the south. We find limestone household vessels bearing witness to a shared interest in ritual purity, because stone, unlike pottery, was considered incapable of being rendered impure. We find ritual immersion pools, called nikvaiot, in the wealthier homes, like this priestly home in Magdala, beside synagogues, and near many agricultural installations, like olive and wine presses, again bearing witness to a concern to follow the laws for removing pollution laid down in Leviticus. We find ossuaries for the collection and permanent storage of a deceased person's bones after his or her flesh had decayed, just as one finds throughout the first century tombs of Judea. And one is hard pressed to find pig bones anywhere, suggesting adherence to the dietary laws laid down in the Law of Moses, 
Of course, there is also a near absence of pagan cultic sites in the region from the late second century BC through the late first century AD. Indeed, this shared material culture suggests that many Galileans were descended from Judean settlers from the period of Hasmonean expansion, and that they continued to prioritize local Jewish identity and the practices of ritual purity that helped underscore and define that distinctive identity. By all accounts, Galileans remained closely connected with Jerusalem and its temple. They participated in the pilgrimage festivals of Passover, Pentecost, and Booths, and they flocked to the temple's defense whenever it was threatened with desecration, as happened dramatically under Caligula. The Hasmonean dynasty succumbed to internal rivalry and civil war between 67 and 68 BC. In 63, did I say 68? Between 67 and 63 BC. In 63, Rome intervened to force a settlement, choosing Hyrcanus, the elder of two brothers who did have the more legitimate claim to rule, but who was also decidedly less popular, and even more so once he was propped up by a foreign power. Between 63 and 37 BC, however, first Aristobulus, the younger brother, and then his sons, continued to stir up civil strife in an effort to take control. Galilee suffered more than its share during this period because a good portion of its population kept lending active support to Aristobulus and his heirs. Many battles in the course of these uprisings were fought in Galilee, resulting in a good deal of destruction and large-scale interruptions of the fragile agricultural economy. One lost growing season could make a huge difference in the financial stability, even the financial survival of a family. Alongside this, Galilee was subjected to some heavy-handed shakedowns and suppression of revolutionary activity on the part of the Romans, who continued to act as watchdogs first for Hyrcanus and then for Herod the Great, their approved client rulers over Judea and Galilee. For all that, it would be a mistake to think of Galilee's population as particularly revolutionary. The majority of its inhabitants were farmers, whose concerns only occasionally rose above planting and harvesting the next cycle of crops. Subsistence level living does not give much leisure for dissent and resistance. And however secure most Galileans were upon their land at the beginning of Roman oversight of the region, many were well positioned to have lost it or to be on the precipice of losing it by the time Herod the Great died. Jesus was born just about that time. The Roman Emperor Augustus, with whom Herod was on very friendly terms for most of his life, honored the arrangements Herod had proposed for his territory in his last will and testament. The lion's share of the kingdom, Judea, Samaria, and Idumea, a region to the south of Judea, would go to his oldest surviving son, Archelaus. I say oldest surviving, because Herod had executed his three oldest sons for treason by the time Herod himself had died. We hear about this Archelaus in Matthew 2. After bringing Mary and Jesus back from Egypt, Joseph avoids settling in Judea because of Archelaus's already bad reputation. Archelaus would be removed by Augustus 10 years later, and all his territory come under the direct administration of a Roman prefect. The northeastern quarter of the kingdom, mostly occupied by non-Jews, would go to Herod's third oldest surviving son, Philip, who would rule it peacefully and by all accounts well for 40 years until his own death. Galilee and an area east of the Jordan called Perea would go to Herod's second oldest surviving son, Antipas, 
Contrary to what we read in Mark chapter 6, verse 14, none of these three individuals received the title of king. Archelaus was an ethnarch. Antipas and Philip were tetrarchs. Luke chapter 3, verse 1 gets it right in this regard. Coins minted in Galilee by Antipas reflect this title clearly, as can be seen on the um, front of this coin. On the reverse, there are two, um, uh, two branches around the name Tiberius, the city where the coin was minted. On the front, um, there is um, Herodu Tetrarchu in the um, that is the legend around the margin. So it is of Herod the Tetrarch. I think it must have been particularly difficult for Herod Antipas to accept his second-rate kingdom and his third-rate title, since in Herod's second-to-last will, Antipas was to be sole king over the whole realm. Of course, he was in no position to do anything about it except stew, perhaps for years. Note, by the way, that Antipas, like his father Herod before him, did not put his own image on his coins out of respect for the second commandment, or at least out of respect for his subjects who respected the second commandment. <laughs> Philip's coins are quite different, reflecting the typical, typical coinage throughout the rest of the Roman Empire sporting either his own image or images of the current emperor, images of the temples in Philip's kingdom, and the like, since, again, almost all of Philip's subjects were Gentiles. Rome used client kings, ethnarchs, and tetrarchs to secure Rome's interests in various regions while taking on less direct responsibility and thus less expense and less trouble for those regions. Antipas was responsible for maintaining his own military force, enough for internal policing, and to serve as a bulwark against possible aggression from neighbors. In Antipas's case, this would be the Nabataean kingdom, whose territory adjoined Perea. You might remember that Antipas divorced his wife in order to marry Herodias, who had likewise divorced her husband, another son of Herod the Great, who was just a private citizen, in order to trade up, as it were. Well, Antipas's first wife was a daughter of the Nabataean king, and so an ally became an enemy. In any event, when we think of the centurion in Capernaum, who tried to be a local benefactor by subsidizing the construction of the synagogue there, and who approached Jesus through the local Jewish elders to ask for healing for his servant, we should think of him belonging more to Antipas's local border police than to the Roman army. Capernaum was the last town in Antipas's fiefdom before one entered his brother Philip's territory. Antipas was also responsible for raising his own budget through the sale of the produce of his own vast estates, the taxation of his subjects and their property, and other taxes like import and export duties. According to Mark chapter 2, verse 14, Jesus finds Levi, also known as Matthew, sitting at a customs kiosk in Capernaum. This was again a border town, and so this was an appropriate border town phenomenon, collecting import taxes on goods being brought into Antipas's territory from or through Philip's territory, quite likely also taxing goods being exported in that direction. Such taxation grossly inflated the costs of goods on either side, which is why imported goods were luxury items generally out of reach, and why being an exporter involved a good deal of capital limiting the market for the goods one produced if one lacked the means to pay export and import taxes. Many of the villages throughout Galilee would have been quite small. Think of a population of 300 to 400 for a village like Nazareth. 
Capernaum was large for a village. Population estimates based on acreage of residential area and likely occupancy per acre suggest a figure somewhere around 1200. The most distinctive ancient structure in Capernaum is its synagogue. This was likely true in the first century as well, though the synagogue that visitors can see today was built in the late Roman period, think fourth or fifth century AD. The structure stands out all the more because it is the only building made from bright pinkish limestone in the midst of a sea of black basalt buildings, the more readily available building material used for all of the residential and small industrial complexes uncovered in Capernaum. The synagogue of first century Capernaum was significantly smaller and far less ornate. If you look carefully, you can see the black basalt foundations of an earlier building underneath the layers of pink limestone. These earlier foundations do not extend all the way under the present synagogue and certainly do not extend under the large forecourt on the east side. While it is not certain that these basalt foundations belonged to the first century synagogue, it was most common for renovated or new structures to be built over the older structures they were meant to replace. Besides, no other candidates for the location of the first century synagogue have been unearthed to this point. So everything points to this as the authentic space where in an earlier version of the present structure, Jesus is remembered to have preached and to have cast out a demon in Mark chapter 1, 21 to 28. By the late first century BC, the synagogue had become an important and pervasive institution in Judea and Galilee. The synagogue as an institution appears to have its origin in, in Jewish communities far removed from Judea, where the need to develop structures for social and religious cohesion among Jews would have been greater and more keenly felt, and where the temple in Jerusalem could not serve such a function on anything like a regular basis as it could at least for the inhabitants of Judea proper. Inscriptions from Egypt in the second half of the third century BCE attest to the existence of prosuchai, houses of prayer, as places uh, where Jews would gather for the expression of their common devotion. These would quickly grow to become centers serving a wide variety of com community functions, including communal ju ju uh, community judicial cases, the drawing up of contracts, wills, and marriage documents, the laying out of corpses for mourning and funerary rites, and the discussion of matters of community concern. The shift in terminology from prosuchai, prayer houses, to synagogai, our more familiar synagogues, places of gathering, may reflect <clears throat> the acknowledgement of the growing range of purposes served by this institution, though Josephus can still use the term prayer house to refer to a large structure in Tiberias of Galilee that clearly also served other community functions, such as that of a community center where common concerns could be discussed. <clears throat> Synagogues were, of course, places for the reading and studying of the Torah and other scriptures. This is directly reflected in memories of Jesus' teaching ministry in Galilee, for example, in Mark 1 and again in Mark 6, certainly in Luke chapter 4, verse 16 and following, generally on Sabbaths. It was the natural place for the majority of Jews to gain the level of proficiency in the law about which both first century Jewish authors Josephus and Philo will boast. We can't be certain what a prayer and study service in a first century synagogue looked like, we do hear about synagogue services in the Mishnah, uh, a codification of Jewish legal opinions and practices committed to writing only around 200 AD, and that is about as close as we can get. According to this source, the liturgy started with a recitation of the Shema, the fundamental faith statement of Jews that begins with the declaration, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, 
the Lord alone. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. It was followed by a series of prayers known as the 18 benedictions, the Shemone Esre. These prayers cultivate an awareness that God is merciful toward his people's iniquities, pardoning them, and also toward their infirmities, healing them. God also provides for them in life through the provision of food and safety, and in death through the hope of the resurrection. The prayers also reinforce the conviction that the God of the universe is also in some special sense the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the defender of their descendants, Israel. The prayers orient the worshiper's hopes in a decidedly nationalistic direction, nurturing a longing for the land of Israel, the glorification of Jerusalem, the restoration of native leadership as opposed to foreign domination, and the regathering of the Jews living outside the land. These prayers were followed by the reading from and discussion of the Torah, a portion of the Torah, and the whole closes with a recitation of the priestly benediction wherever a quorum of ten is gathered. Despite the common claim that women were seated in a separate section in Roman period synagogues, no archaeological or literary evidence from the period lends its support to that claim. Can we get closer to the first century synagogues that Jesus would have frequented in order to teach, to heal, admittedly also to stir things up? Yes, if we leave Capernaum and travel to the sites of nearby towns, if we walk just six miles west from Capernaum, along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, we come to the larger village of Magdala, an important center for the fishing industry in the region. Here we can see the entire floor and a few feet of the walls of a bona fide first century synagogue. We know this because the area was disturbed by efforts to erect fortifications during the Jewish revolt of 66 to 70 AD, after which this portion of the settlement at least lay derelict. The large gathering room has a depressed central area, surrounded on all sides with a row of benches, then another tier with another fully surrounding row of benches. The floor was decorated with black and white mosaics featuring, featuring geometric patterns, and some of the walls show that they had been plastered and painted in the style of the most basic frescoes from Pompeii. Signs both that there were wealthy patrons of the local synagogue and that they took pride in the adornments in the adornment of this important common building. The focus was all on the center space, where there was likely a stand for reading and expounding on the scroll of the law. And when we read that Jesus, quote, traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons, as we do in Mark 139. It seems highly likely that he would have done so here in Magdala as well, the town associated with Mary Magdalene. If we were to walk 10 miles east from Capernaum into the Golan Hills, we would come to the fortified town of Gamla, another perfect time capsule from 68 AD, the year the Romans besieged the town and killed the majority of its inhabitants. One of the points at which the Romans breached its walls is clearly visible today. The site was never resettled, though it was stripped of a lot of building materials over the centuries. The remnants of the synagogue here have a footprint similar to the one found at Magdala and to other first century synagogues made by the Jewish rebels who took over Masada and Herodian during the Great Revolt of 66 to 70. Indeed, the footprint here one larger open central space and multiple rows of benches surrounding the outside perimeter is the more common one. There was also a study room attached to this synagogue, a small room fitted with benches around the perimeter. <laughs> Ritual immersion pools or mikvayot, like this one at Gamla are frequently found adjacent to synagogues, reminiscent of the same surrounding the Jerusalem temple. 
This might reflect merely a concern for safeguarding the ritual purity of others when gathering, though it might also indicate that those attending uh, to prayer and study were aware that they were preparing for an encounter with the Holy One, and doing so in a manner analogous to preparation for entering the temple precincts. A second prominent feature of the Capernaum site is the partially reconstructed residential blocks surrounding the synagogue on three of its sides. The walls are made of the ubiquitous basalt stone that is far more readily available than wood. Of course, the most celebrated of these is the residence um, uh, identified as early as the late first century as the house of Peter, uh, around which an octagonal church had been built by the fourth century, and which may in fact have spurred the resident Jewish community on to improve its synagogue. Uh, but centuries of veneration have obliterated any sense of what Peter's house was like when it served as a family compound. Like the synagogue, the current layout of the residences reflects their latest stage of occupation, likely the 5th century AD, not the 1st century state of affairs. Two factors, however, suggest that we're still close to the 1st century shape of housing in Capernaum. First, the streets and the walkways, though not near the quality of Roman civic streets, would tend to keep the perimeters of residential blocks consistent. Second, the conservative nature of village life and building techniques, where one was pretty much on one's own when it came to renovation and expansion projects, suggests uh, less rather than more change over the generations. What does change with some frequency is the layout of any particular block. As one family expands and makes a successful bid to purchase some portion of a neighbor's house, little more is required than to open up a new door in a solid wall and fill in a former doorway to create a new solid wall. This likely accounts for a good deal of the irregularity in layout that we see in Capernaum. That said, one can still see traces here of first century dwellings typical, both in Galilee and in Judea. These tend to be small three or four room dwellings, perhaps 300 to 600 square feet total, opening onto an open courtyard, which is often a common courtyard shared by the residents of more than one dwelling. Thus, multiple families or multiple segments of extended families might end up sharing a common courtyard area. While the houses in Capernaum largely had stone floors by the fifth century, the floors were likely simply made from beaten earth in the first century. The largest room was a multi-purpose room for cooking, dining, and often sleeping. The smaller rooms were used to store grain, other dry goods, olive oil, and wine. The stairways visible in some units signal that there were once upper lofts, probably little more than landings made from planks, generally for sleeping if this was not done in the multi-purpose room. Most activities, including flower grinding, weaving, and other household crafts would be pursued in the courtyard in fair weather, where livestock would also be kept at least during the night small vegetable gardens planted, and chickens and doves raised for their eggs, meat, and fertilizer. Cooking might be done in indoor kitchens or in corners of courtyards. You can see the remains of the base of a clay oven installation in the center of this photo. Entrance to the complex was generally through a single door opening onto the courtyard from the street. The exterior walls facing the streets and alleys were typically solid for the sake of security. Light and ventilation came into the dwellings from the courtyard and through the doorways and internal walls, which were often perforated walls, uh, called window walls. Um, these were uh, walls with upright stones supporting uh, horizontal beams, but thus leaving large openings uh, in that particular wall. 
Roofs were made of thatched fronds, waterproofed with mud, laid over horizontal poles or beams, hence the ability to dig through a roof, as we hear about when a paralyzed man's friends lower him through Peter's roof to set him right in front of Jesus to be healed in Mark 2, verse 4. Such were the conditions under which the majority of the population of both Galilee and Judea would have lived in the first century. Galilee's economy was, like that of most of the Mediterranean world, primarily agricultural. The region was surprisingly fertile, as one can see by the presence of lush vegetation around the basin and the ongoing planting of large-scale crops on a number of the hillside, many of which are now fruit crops protected from the sun and animals by acre-sized burlap canopies. Wheat, olive trees, and grapevines were the principal crops, as these also produced the three most basic staples of the diet not only here but throughout the Mediterranean bread, olive oil, and wine. Most, sorry, visitors to Capernaum can see one of the standard tools for processing wheat into usable flour. These basalt mills are industry standard throughout the Eastern Mediterranean. The top piece had an hourglass design open to the top and bottom. The lower piece was a cone on which the top piece sat with maximum contact around all of its uh, sides on the bottom half. The lower um, piece is clearly visible in the photo to the right alongside the complete pair. The upper grinding stone was fitted with a wooden yoke and poles that allowed it to be turned against the lower stone. The wheat was poured into the top, ground by the turning stones, with flour falling out along the bottom seam. Olives were processed in two steps. Several examples of the stone elements of both steps can be seen at Capernaum. The large circular stone basin and round crushing stone represent the first step in which the olives along with their pits are crushed to a pulp. Here you can see what one of these instruments would have looked like in a functional state, down to the harness that the animal would have worn to work the mechanism. The pulp would have been scooped up, placed in burlap sacks, and stacked on a large stone with a circular channel carved into it, leading to a lip. This would be the olive press proper, where the oil would be expressed either by a weighted lever, as in this reconstruction, or by the pressure created by a screw mechanism. The stones here on the right represent the base of a screw press and the collection vat into which the expressed oil would pour. The oil was a staple food, not just a cooking medium as it tends to be for Americans. Breakfast might consist of a hunk of bread and a little oil for dipping. Oil was also the fuel used for artificial light in the lamps that are found throughout the Mediterranean from this period. Of course, grapes also required processing to turn them into wine, the principal drink in the ancient Mediterranean. Perhaps the best example of a treading floor or wine press from the time of Jesus is to be found in an industrial complex adjacent to Herod's palace complex just outside of Jericho. Grapes are trodden underfoot in the large basin in the rear, and the juice runs through a channel into the collection basin in the front. It would be fermented and stored in clay amphorae. Wine was, for the record, almost always drunk watered down, even at dinner parties. The host would determine the ratio of wine to water. There were, of course, other crops like dates, figs, lentils, chickpeas, and other protein-rich legumes. Families would often keep small gardens for vegetables and fruits. And while we're thinking about diet, think about the small livestock kept by many families in their courtyards throughout the villages of Galilee and Judea. Chickens for eggs and occasionally meat, goats for milk and cheese, 
And of course, around the Sea of Galilee, they also had ready access to fish. Fishing was obviously an important facet of the economy of the villages and towns surrounding the Sea of Galilee, and people from Galilee, Perea, and the Decapolis all had a piece of it, as it were. Capernaum is celebrated as the home of four apostles who came from two fishing families, though there is little evidence of the industry there aside from fish hooks found in the courtyards of some of the houses. A much celebrated find from the Sea of Galilee is the lower part of the hull of a small first century boat discovered close to the shoreline during a time of drought. This boat had to be very carefully protected and packed before moving and quickly preserved because the wood would simply disintegrate upon being touched. This may well have been used for the purpose of fishing, but it probably accommodated no more than four workers and their gear. Visitors to Magdala can see the quay and the boat slips that were in use here during the first century BC and AD, much of the traffic being from fishermen bringing their surplus hauls to this important town. The location of the quay in, reveals, incidentally, just how much the lake has receded and how much the shores have been built up by silting since the turn of the era. An excavated block just south of the synagogue in Magdala has been identified as an industrial area, one side of which sports an unusual row of square vats. While archaeologists remain uncertain, one strong proposal is that these were used to store and process fish brought in from the lake, whether by salting or pickling, or even reduction to garum, a fish-based sauce that was the ketchup, if you will, of the Roman world. Fish thus processed could be exported to a number of the Decapolis cities, Judea, Idumea, and beyond. There is one other important facet of the Galilean economy to acknowledge, and this is Herod Antipas's building activity. His work pales in comparison to that of his father, Herod the Great, but his income was also less than a third of his father's. Antipas's first project was to rebuild and expand Sepphoris, a city located in the heart of Lower Galilee, about halfway between the Sea of Galilee and the Mediterranean coast. It was, perhaps not insignificantly, just four miles north of Nazareth, little more than an hour's walk for a father and sons involved in masonry and carp uh, carpentry. Sepphoris had been a small fortified city for about 200 years. Visitors can still see the remains of a residential area from the first century BC, so the late Hasmonean, early Herodian period. The presence of mikvaiot among the resonances, like the one uh, in the front right of this photo, demonstrates the inhabitants to have included a number of priestly families. The city suffered heavy damage and depopulation in the revolts that followed upon Herod the Great's death in 4 BC. Antipas decided to rebuild it with the goal of making it, as Josephus puts it, the ornament of all Galilee, as would befit his capital city. Sepphoris didn't satisfy Antipas for long. Within 20 years, he was breaking ground for an entirely new city where only a cemetery had sat before. His new capital would be set winsomely on the southwest shore of the Sea of Galilee and just north of some hot springs. He named it Tiberias in honor of Augustus's successor, Tiberius, of course. Tiberias had the fortifications of a wall and city gates, the city gates um, being visible in this uh, photo, actually between the two towers of this photo. It also had a theater, the lowermost remains of which uh, are still visible today, um, and it reportedly also had a large synagogue or prayer house, though uh, the foundations of this structure have not yet been identified. Antipas was clearly trying to provide both for the Jewish citizens as well as the non-Jews who would be attracted to his cities and, of course, 
employed in his administration. Sepphoris and Tiberius gave Antipas an outlet for his ambitions to improve his disappointingly small realm, but these still remained very modest cities in comparison with Beit Shan, a Decapolis city just to the south of Galilee, or Caesarea by the sea, Herod's magnificent seaport on the Mediterranean. Antipas reportedly kept an eye on Jesus and an ear out for what he was up to. His execution of John the Baptist, attested in both the Gospels and in Josephus, is a stark reminder of Antipas's power over life and death and the powerlessness even of popular figures in the face of it. When the Pharisees warned Jesus, get away from here for Herod wants to kill you, the danger was likely quite real. And while Jesus might have been assured that he would only die in God's time in the appointed manner, it is noteworthy that there is no mention of either Sepphoris or Tiberius in the gospel narratives of Jesus' proclamation of the kingdom of God. He appears to have avoided Antipas's crown cities quite purposefully. Would the building of these cities have benefited the Galilean economy? or stifled it through Herod Antipas's demands for taxes and tribute from the people of his realm to pay for his ambitions. On the one hand, the building projects certainly meant increased prosperity for some. For example, the hundreds or potentially the thousands of masons, artisans, and laborers working on the cities, as well as those staffing the service industries that would arise to sustain urban life. On the other hand, these efforts would have drained a good deal of local resources and villagers' meager wealth through ongoing and potentially increased taxation without the benefit of the additional income. To return to these villagers and their situation, the ancient Israelite ideal was that every family would own its own land and achieve sustainability through farming their own land. The Assyrian, Babylonian, Persian, and Macedonian occupations of this territory severely messed with this ideal. Truth be told, even before the Assyrian and Babylonian invasions, the Hebrew prophets decried the practice of joining house to house by which the rich got richer and the poor were alienated from their land. The Hasmonean high priestly kings sought to reverse this trend by recapturing the historic territories of Israel and allowing their Judean subjects to colonize them. Even so, the ideal of every person sitting beneath his or her own fig tree or vine would never be recovered and, to the extent that it did, would not last. By the time of Jesus, the ordinary Jewish family's hold on their land was growing quite tenuous. No doubt a good number of people continued to own the land that had been in their families since the Judean recolonization of Galilee, but a good number of people were also reduced to working land that was owned now by others, sharing in the produce, but ultimately working for another's profit. Since the early periods of foreign domination, large swaths of territory were designated royal lands, and farmed by, by villages full of tenant farmers for the benefit of the current ruler. These royal lands remain fairly consistent, at least from the Persian through the Roman periods. When cities were established, it was customary also to assign them hinterlands, the amount of workable arable land required to sustain their projected population. Thus the labors of villages of farmers, would again be directed toward benefiting others. Then, of course, there was the common situation of a family falling into debt because a few bad seasons put them so far behind in the taxes they owed and failed to allow them to repay debts taken out to secure seed for a second or third failed harvest. This would often lead to the necessary sale of their land to pay off the debt, sometimes with them remaining as tenant farmers, sometimes with them being driven off their land to work other land or to seek out work 
as day laborers in the cities, often to be hired to go back out to work the lands of the wealthy landowners. These were some of the economic realities of both Galilee and Judea reflected in Jesus' parables. For example, the parable of the laborers in the vineyard who are hired throughout the day as the landowner returned to the city square in Matthew 20, 1 through 16. Or the parable of the wicked tenants in Mark 12, 1 through 11. The landowner in the first parable is doing what I imagine few, if any, landowners in Galilee or Judea would actually do. But Jesus knows what happens to the families of those laborers if they do not get hired that day, and if they don't go home with a full day's wage. And he challenges both landowners and those who enjoy more stable work to show greater compassion and generosity. The sting of the second parable, the parable of the wicked tenants, is that the chief priests and the elders to whom Jesus addresses the parable are almost all likely in the position of the owner of vineyards and lands who rents out the lands to tenants and sits back waiting for his share of their labor. This is why in Mark's version of the parable, at least, they are so eager to see the vineyard owner take vengeance on the tenants and are so put off when Jesus casts them in the role of the murderous tenants of God's vineyard. A visit to Capernaum takes us close to the everyday realities of Jesus' own life and the lives of those who heard him, followed him, and of course, rejected him. It reminds us of the distance we need to travel in our minds to enter the lived contents of the stories and the teachings of Jesus and to feel more fully and precisely the impact he sought to have so that we can think more fully and precisely about the impact those texts ought to have in our very different contexts. It puts us in touch with a synagogue and its functions as an institution. It puts us in touch with the residential arrangements of the majority of Jesus' neighbors and the different notion of a home as a place of production and not merely of consumption. It puts us in touch with some of the most basic features of the economy that literally put food on the table and some of the serious inequities in the distribution of the fruits of labor. Hopefully, in the end, it brings us into closer touch with the Son of Man, who made Capernaum, for a season at least, his own town.